Hello, everybody, and welcome again to Nerd to the Third Power, your one-stop shop for all things nerdy and awesome. I'm your host and master of ceremonies, Dr. Gonzo. With me, as always, in this epic quest of awesomeness is our resident anime goddess, the cat. Cat, how you doing this week? I'm, I'm okay. I've been trying to fight off what I think is another case of bronchitis, so I'm trying real hard not to have bronchitis right now. <laughs> That's my normal state of being, though, for real. <laughs> Just a, just a continuous long war against you and bronchitis. Yeah, I mean, like, that's been, like, my last two years. <laughs> Me versus the bronchitis. Ash versus the evil dead. Autobots versus the Decepticons. <laughs> Coke versus Pepsi. Joe versus the volcano. That's the level of rivalry. <laughs> I'm not familiar with that last one. Oh, it was, like, a Tom Hanks movie from the early 90s? All right, well, we got a fun show uh, for you guys this week. Today, we're discussing something that uh, you guys have been asking us to talk about for a while, uh, and now we're finally getting on to it with uh, Season three's release, and that is Stranger Things, uh, the hit Netflix series that just had its third season come out uh, a couple weeks ago, and uh, I've been really excited about it. I know Kat's really excited about it, so uh, yeah, it's going to be a fun show. So uh, definitely a lot to talk about that. Uh, but of course, there is procedure to follow, so we are going to begin, as always, with Ask a Geek. And first question here, uh, let's see here now. Let's see if we got a get, get, if we can get a weird one here. Um, okay, uh, here's a question uh, from Melanie, and her question is for me, and it is, "What is the weirdest thing that I have ever seen in somebody's game collection?" Uh, and I actually have an answer for this one uh, that uh, that really surprised me, even when I saw it. Um, I w- recently, uh, just a couple weeks ago, I uh, went with a friend of mine up to. We did a, a, a circuit of our retro stores we hit up in pennsylvania uh and in one of the stores uh we found and if you're watching on youtube i'm actually going to include uh the video clip that i took of this thing i found this starlight children's foundation nintendo 64 cart and it's basically just this, this giant cart with a tv built into it um with an n64 and some games hooked up to it that you know you the hospitals would wheel went around to uh, children's wards where kids are like waiting for surgery or her confined to the beds because of some vicious hell disease um, and this store had one of these carts uh, in their stock, and it was for sale. And can I tell you just how hard it was for me to not just whip out my debit card and just drop the fifteen hundred dollars for this thing just right there? But I was like, yeah, I'm in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and I don't think I can fit this in, in the trunk of a Prius. I'm gonna have to come back when I have adequate transport. So. Uh, that I would say is is the strangest thing that I've ever seen. Uh, not necessarily in someone's collection, but just out in the wild. Um, so yeah, that's that's definitely the most out there thing that I've seen uh, yet. But if there's one thing that I've learned about game collecting, it's that there is always something even weirder out there. So I eagerly look forward to the day where I find something that actually tops that. Um, Kat, what about you? What's what's the weirdest thing you've ever seen uh, in an in an anime collection or or, or on sale at an anime con? Oh gosh, like the weirdest, I I don't know, because honestly, my concept of what's weird is pretty skewed, because anime fans, (laughs) um, the anime fans in general are pretty fucking weird. (laughs) Um, I I honestly can't think of anything weird, like anything that I would consider weird. Um, Besides the fact that, like, it's a little bit harder for us to get stuff here. Like mer- our merchant, our like legal merchandise options in this country are are very small compared to like say like if you were in Japan. Um, I I probably saw some weird shit in Japan. Um, if I could just rack my brain for long enough, I know they have really weird merch there. <laughs> um, like I'll I'll go I'll say this: there are some weird like merch uh, like merch opportunities in Japan, like um stuff that I haven't seen personally but I know exists are like when they they do like one piece is being used as in an advertising campaign for like Gillette razors or something like that um, and you're just like what does this have to do with anything what does this have to do with anything so you get some random item just any old normal item and then it's got a, an anime character on it and you're like <laughs> I, when I lived in Japan, they had a thing going on with the um, 
the the local sports team, and by that I mean one of the most important baseball teams in the country, was the Hunchin Tigers, and they just had like just like a Coke bottle or something, and then they if you bought it, you would get like a Hunchin Tigers like phone charm. And I was like, why? I mean, like, really, but w- these things don't really necessarily go with each other. I mean, I guess I get it, but still, it's just, like, you get some weird combinations there. You know, I act- that actually makes me think of something uh, in, in, in the gaming side of things. Uh, are you familiar with the, the Daya Hawks? No. They're a, they're a Japanese sports team. Well, they had a tie-in with Nintendo, and they and Nintendo actually produced a line of special edition Daya Hawks branded uh, Nintendo 64 consoles that are actually pretty highly sought after here on our side of the pond. Interesting. They were like these these bright orange translucent consoles. If you want to know something really weird um, that I have seen for sale is, um, you know, because Hello Kitty is a thing. We all know Hello Kitty. We all know Kitty Jen. Mm-hmm. Um, Hello Kitty is just a merchandising thing. I mean, it's oh, I think solid. I know where you're going with this. <laughs> yeah. So a couple years ago, Hello Kitty did a crossover with Kiss, the band. So they released a bunch of merch with like Hello Kitty characters with the Kiss hair and the Kiss makeup. And like, it was so strange. It, it, it just made me go, what was Kiss thinking? I get what Hello Kitty was thinking. <laughs> Like, was Kiss like, oh, yeah, we love Hello Kitty. Like, I don't know, but it's so crazy that there was all this merch out. And you could probably still find it, um, like, online and stuff. I, I think I think I've actually seen one of those recently. Those those Hello Kitty Kiss dolls. That yeah. that. I that, that gotta, gotta gotta say though that was uh, that was when when you brought up Hello Kitty that was not the direction I thought you were gonna go with that. <laughs> oh gosh, which way were you thinking? Well, I immediately had a flashback to uh, the Hello Kitty episode of the Toys that made us, where they talked about the quote unquote shoulder massager. Hint hint, oh, nudge nudge. That is a thing, guys. They made Hello Kitty <laughs> dildos. It's a thing. <laughs> shoulder <laughs> massagers, because that's a thing. Yeah, that's right up there with uh, with with with, ethic, with uh, ethical mechanics is, is loot boxes. Yeah, who are you trying to fool? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think the crossover with Kiss is weirder than the than the vibrators and dildos and stuff. I think that's still weirder. Yeah, you know what? I got I got to give you that because, like, you know the, the 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 vibrator. That's just like you're you know it's like you've done everything else. You may you know you may as well tick off this one last box. But <laughs> Hello Kitty and Kiss, someone had to sit there and think of that for a while. That was a meeting. That was like several meetings going, what can we do next? Huh. And then people were throwing out ideas and writing them up on a board and crossing stuff out because it was too inconceivable. And somebody circled Kiss up on a board and was like, that's a, that's the one we're doing. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, it could, could have been a, could have been worse. It could have gone to the, the, the Rolling Stones and had a, had a, a, a Keith Richards branded, uh, Hello Kitty that came with like a heroin needle. You know, if if Keith Richards was just a little more distinctive looking, that's because I, I think that's what it was with Kiss is they're so distinctive looking. You just you look at the branding and you're like, I know what this is. <laughs> so that's what they were going for because it's like Hello Kitty. You're like, oh, that's how that's that's Kitty. That's the same thing with Kiss. It's immediate recognition. Yeah, anyway. the, the 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 one thing they're missing was like they they because yeah, I'm looking at the picture one right now. They didn't give her Gene Simmons tongue, but I guess that makes sense because she has no mouth and yet she must scream. No <laughs> there used to be a website called Hello Kitty Has No Mouth. Oh God, that's a throwback. Yeah, this that was, was like what so 2002, 2003. So long ago, Hello Kitty Has No Mouth, but they make Hello Kitty toothpaste. That was the whole website. It was like Hello Kitty Has No Mouth, but. Dot, dot, dot. Now I'm curious. Is it still there? Yeah, that, that I, I'm I'm curious. I'm googling it and I don't see. Uh, nope, it just brings me the the because like, but I remember that Hello Kitty has no mouth. Um. Oh no! Wait, yes it is. Yes it is. It's still here. <gasps> oh my god, guys, we have made an archaeological discovery. <laughs> Well, I well I don't see anything about the toothpaste, but I see like the original meme page where it's, where it's got like Hello Kitty has no mouth, but she must scream. That is why her head is so big. Hello Kitty has no mouth, yet she speaks the truth. Hello Kitty has no mouth, so where has all the porridge gone? I'm gonna include the link to this underneath the feed. This is like legit internet history here. 
this is yeah this is so old this is stuff like we were joking about like yeah probably like 15 years ago oh older than that copyright 1998 jesus fucking christ yeah but this website's older 1998 (laughs) This... But still, this is stuff like Gonzo and I joked about when we were in college together many, many moons ago. This, 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 this website could vote. This website could go, could vote, could go to war and die for its country. <laughs> All right, okay. Let's see. Uh, but yeah, I'm going to include a, a link, a link to this underneath the underneath the the, the feed here for you guys to check out. Uh, and uh, let's see here now. Next question here. Uh, to do, do, do um. Here is a question uh, from Danny, and uh, and this is a question for Skyblaze, so uh, that one's going to have to wait. Uh, let's see here now. Um, oh, here's one that uh, that that is uh, nice and topical. Here's one from Peter, and his uh, question is: What are our thoughts on the live action? Which I kind of have to bite back a retort on this: the live action Lion King film that just came out. To which I say, I, I, I have no plans on seeing this movie, but like everything I've seen, every every shot I've seen from this movie looks like they hired the color coordinator from the Call of Duty games because everything is just brown. So much brown. No color, but brown. <laughs> I I have thoughts on it. My thoughts aren't wholly negative. I I think that it's probably fine. It's probably fine i've heard the soundtrack's really good i've seen a lot of people saying oh my gosh i just started crying as soon as the first song came up and i'm like that's your nostalgia talking what about your analysis (laughs) um i just i don't i don't have really strong feelings one way or the other i don't plan on seeing it in theaters because i don't want to give my money to disney for this i don't want disney to keep making live action versions of things that are fine things are fine exactly the way they are like there's a reason why we make animated films to begin with we make animated films to do the things that live action films can't and like as soon as we start making all of those things into live action films it loses something and it's hard to say exactly what it loses but in the lion king's case we know that it loses all of those wonderful facial expressions and and like the appearances of the characters being very distinctive. Um, there's just that that bit that's lost. That is why they made it a cartoon in the first place. So I I don't want to support. I've I've seen like one. I saw Beauty and the Beast because Beauty and the Beast is my favorite Disney film. Like period, and, and you know what? That one at least did some new things with the source material. Like yeah, it wasn't much, things. but it was there. And and that one, it 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 made sense. There's been so many different adaptations of Beauty and the Beast. You know, like not just Disney, but other versions. You know, it's it's not inconceivable for them to do a live action version. There was, you know, like it it did its own thing, and it's fine. And, you know, like, I didn't see Cinderella because there's already been a million live-action versions of Cinderella. I don't give a shit about Maleficent. You can't make me give a shit about Maleficent. Um, So I do want to see Aladdin. I just, I haven't had the chance. Um, Because that one, I think, will translate better to being live-action. I just, I just haven't gotten around to it yet. Um, But on the whole, like, I'm not, like, Dumbo, never watching it. I there's just so many of them where it's like it doesn't add anything new first off it doesn't add anything new to that property like you're not doing something different with it or particularly unique or but also you're not adding anything new to film like you're not doing anything new or groundbreaking or interesting you know like not every film has to do that but I think if you're going to make money on something twice, you should probably just, you know, vary it up a little bit. And from what I understand, like, Lion King just doesn't really do that. Yeah, I just, yeah, I just. And there's also, also there's the... literally no point of, of animating a realistic, because it's not live action, it's just a realistic version of Lion King. There's just no point 
It is already animated, and now you're just animating it to look real. It yeah. was fine. Leave it alone. That, that That's the one thing that sets me off, is people who call this a, a live-action film. It's like, no, it isn't. There are no human actors in this film whatsoever. It well, is, there are it is still there animated. Are voice actors, but nevertheless, and that that's a thing, you know. Voice acting is a legi- it's a legitimate thing. It's well, no, I'm not saying it's not it's not legitimate, but it's like there there there's no human characters. It's right. it's all CGI. It's all CGI animals. It's all CGI backgrounds. It's a CGI movie that makes it animated. It's not live action, and I I want to clothesline anybody who calls The Lion King a live action film. I know, I, I have really had no very passionate fights with my sister them. about this. <laughs> there's no other way to distinguish them other than to say one is live action or like old and new. That's the only other way you could say it. You know, I could deal with old and new, but to, but but if we if we go by the logic that the new Lion King is live action, then by that logic, so was Dinosaur. Ugh. Everybody's been saying live action in quotation marks. That's <laughs> that's the way I've seen it. I haven't seen anybody who actually thinks it's live action. <laughs> but um, it's just I just there's some properties that you can just leave the fuck alone. And and I've heard some people say that they're doing all these remake, remakes to hold on to licenses. And I've heard other people say that that's not the case. Um, because, you know, like they have to like produce something every once in a while in order to not lose like the trademark or the copyright or whatever. Um, and I've heard other people say that that's not really the case for this, you know, for these like Disney movies and stuff. You know the patents aren't well, ready to that, run out. I mean that argument makes sense for things like say Cinderella or Maleficent that are based on public domain properties. But I mean the Lion King, unless you want to get into the whole Simba <laughs> versus Kimba argument, which is a discussion for an entirely separate table. You know that was a wholly Disney created product. There's no license to lose. Well, you know, like something might eventually go public domain. You know. Like, that's why they, like, uh, years ago, they changed the, like, every time you go see a Disney movie, there's, like, Steamboat Willie driving it, and they, like, made a new Steamboat Willie animation so they could patent it so they could keep Steamboat Willie. Yep. <clears throat> so, like, that kind of thing. Like, they just gotta keep doing it to make sure it doesn't, they don't lose it. They don't fall into public domain. Yeah. Um. So, but uh, I've heard that that's not actually true. That's not why they're doing it. And I would believe that it's not true and that they're just doing it to, to make money, to cash in. Got to get those dollar dollar bills. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, I'm not wholly against it. There, there are some franchises that I think lend themselves well to live action versions, you know, ones with uh, mostly people in them, for example. And Give me a live action three caballeros or get the hell out of my sight. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, shit, I forgot what I was going to say. Um. Um, but it, it does, you know, there is the opportunity to bring, you know, this this franchise to a new generation. But with the release, the um, pending release of the Disney Plus or whatever they're calling their streaming service, the the things that were previously unobtainable, like vaulted movies, are no longer going to be a thing. So to me, it's like, okay we're not restricted like because we can't get the 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 movie on dvd because it's in the vault everything's going to be at our fingertips now so we don't really need to keep remaking a bunch of shit because we'll have the original thing right there so they're just double dipping basically you know i wonder i really do wonder that i wonder if they set out a plan for all these live action movies before their streaming service was finalized or if they are really just like, no, give us all the money. Mm. It's probably just give us all the money. Let's be real. <laughs> so, all right, but that's all the Ask the Geek questions that we have for this week. Thank you as always for sending them in. As always, you can send them to us through the email at drgonzo at nerd of the third power dot com. We love getting your questions, love reading them on the air. So uh, go ahead and get your questions in. You just might get yours read right on the show. And now that we've had our vegetables, let's get right down to the meat of the show, and that is Netflix's Stranger Things, a show that I've been wanting to talk about uh, since season two came out. Uh, I, I was one of the latecomers to Stranger Things. I absolutely fell in love with this show once I once I finally got around to start to, started watching it. 
Um, and so season three came out uh, a couple weeks ago. So we're going to go ahead and talk about uh, our general, you know, kind of just our general thoughts on the on the show as a whole, and then uh, break down season three. So, uh, Kat, I think you were actually the first of us to actually uh, discover Stranger Things. Uh, so let's uh, let's start with you. What 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 drew you to Stranger Things? What what is it about it, about uh, Stranger Things that you enjoy so much? Um, well, first off, I need to state, if I didn't already mention this in a prior episode, that the very first episode of Stranger Things that I ever watched was like a week or two after it launched on Netflix, like season one launched on Netflix. And everybody was saying it was really good. And I didn't know anything about it, except that it was like really 80s themed. And I was really, really sick one day and I was like holding up on the couch and it was like, I was ready to go to bed, but I wasn't quite tired enough. And I'm like, let me put on this show that I actually have no interest in, really. And I'll just throw that on the TV and veg out for a little while. And then within five minutes, I'm like hyperventilating. I'm like, oh my God, this is so scary. Oh my God. Like, <laughs> like I sat straight the fuck up at the first jump scare. I was like, why did I do this to myself? Um, so you were legit hallucinating. <laughs> it was it was pretty wild. It was a wild ride. Because I... I went in completely blind. I didn't know anything about it. So I didn't expect there to be like a monster right away. <laughs> um, so that was fun. But I have been super hooked on it ever since. There's a lot of different things that make it so enjoyable. Um, one, the nostalgia of everything being the 80s. Um, Gonzo and I are 80s babies. So we were allowed to have nostalgia for the 80s, even though we were quite young during the 80s um but uh so the the nostalgia for for quote unquote simpler times but um the 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 running themes of dungeons and dragons in it is pretty entertaining the the clear homages to other science fiction elements like there's you know homages to uh what close encounters um alien like it basically everything. Yeah, basically like every other every other frame of the series is an homage to some eighties show or or film if you know what you're looking for. Yeah, and it's all just so brilliantly executed. Um the fact that it's it's a really interesting show and there's kids in it, but it's not one hundred percent solely focused on kids or adults, that it, it breaks the, the character screen time down pretty equally. Um you know, it's it's a very emotional series. Everything feels really raw in it. Um, and the kids who are in it are just so talented. I mean, everybody's talented because there's one owner writer in there. It, I mean, it's, it's a lot of really good stuff going on. And it's like a continual mystery, especially the first season of, you know, what's going to happen next. And it's really edge of your seat action. And that's why I love it. <laughs> Yeah, one of the one of the, the two things that I love the most about uh, Stranger Things is one, like you mentioned, how it how it uses the '80s tropes, um, and it 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 kind of you know there's there's so much of this uh, focus now on on subverting tropes and subverting expectations, whereas Stranger Things just kind of plays into the hilt and says, you know what, you know these things don't need to be twisted around at every single turn. We can actually play these to the hilt and still make something good out of it. Like, uh, you know, one of the, 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 the standout ones is, you know, if you've, if you've seen a lot of eighties movies, particularly ones, uh, about kids, you know, there's always the bully character, uh, that, you know, torments the, the lead kids and winds up getting their, their payback in a spectacular and over the top fashion. And, uh, you know, you had, you had those in, uh, in, in, well, you've had, you've had one in some form or another in every season so far. Um, but the ones in the first season are the ones that, that stand out the most to me. Um, just because of how, what fucking little shits they are. Mm. I was, I, I remember like, like, I remember the scene at the, uh, at the, at the, at the, at the cliff side, uh, where L finally, Eleven goes, you know, just goes ham on these bullies. And I remember it being, you know, I'm looking at this like, you know, I should be horrified by what I'm seeing these kids do to these younger kids, what these bullies do. But at the same time, I'm kind of laughing because like, this is just so 80s and it's, it's hysterical. <laughs> <laughs> The other thing that I really like, and, and I want to, this also goes back to your earlier part about how talented the child actors are, is is one of the things that really has bothered me about modern media, about kids or surrounding kids, is there's this tendency to make the kids be almost like miniature adults. Yes. Like they, right. they, 
they 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 know things that they really wouldn't at that age or they 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 have priorities that they wouldn't have at that age but the kids in stranger things are just that they're kids you know and they act and behave as kids would and like the the standout moment is i believe it's in season 1 it's when uh it is when dustin and mike are uh talking in mike's basement and uh mike and um What's, what's, the, what's the black kid's name? I can't remember it off the top Lucas. of my head. And Lucas. And Mike and Lucas have, have had a fight. They're not talking to each other. And Dustin's like, okay, you know, you you, you, you know you know the rules. You drew first blood. You've got to shake his hand. And Mike's like, no, I'm not going to shake his hand. Dustin's like, no, no, you've got to shake his hand. This is the rule of law. Obey or be banished mm-hmm. from the party. And, like, that is just, you know, what what group of friends didn't have those weird playground laws you know, growing up, that you just you, nobody can re- remember who came up with those rules, but they were they were they were unspoken, they were clear, and they were ironclad, and everybody just obeyed them. And it's like, but it, it's it's like that kind of thing that you know solidifies these kids as kids, and I just absolutely love that. Um, and you know, the cast is in in general, you know, it is is large in each season, each season, but the show is so phenomenally paced that nobody nobody's really stealing the spotlight everybody gets kind of an equal level of importance uh to the plot um except for maybe max in season two but i think i think that i think her introduction to season two was to set her up for the arc in season three um so in hindsight you know that's that's a little less egregious than i initially thought it was mm, excuse me um but yeah just just you know there's I don't know. It, 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 you ever you ever watch a, a a a film or a show that you can just tell as you watch it that the people who made it had a real passion for what they were doing. That's what I see in season three. I I can't point to a single actor in this series and think, okay, I don't think he was having a good day this day. It's like you know, I, I, it really feels like everybody is just having an absolute blast making the series, and absolutely loving it, and it really shines through in the performances and the production. You could tell the Duffer brothers are huge nerds. I love that you can tell that they're huge nerds. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, so uh, I guess for, for those who, who haven't seen the show, uh, before we start going down, before we start breaking down season three, we should probably give a quick recap of uh, seasons one and two and, uh, you know, what kind of stuff goes down in there. So, uh, Kat, why don't you go ahead and just give us a, a brief Cliff's Notes of the first two seasons? Oh, brief? Shit. That's going to be hard. Okay. So the basic premise of Stranger Things is that in the quaint town of Hawkins, Indiana in 1985, um, there are a bunch of uh, secret uh, scientists who work for the government doing experiments. And they have a girl who is called Eleven. um, And she escapes Woo, she escapes after she has kind of sort of accidentally like torn a hole into another plane of existence that's sort of like this eldritch monstrosity plane um think silent hill with a lot of uh, a lot more dust <laughs> um or if you're a D or it's very like abyssal <laughs> um there's a lot of call of cthulhu shit going on um and uh there's a group of four friends uh, uh um mike will lucas and dustin um who are kids just four really good friends and a couple of their older siblings and stuff um and will goes missing one night and he has been taken they don't know it but he has been taken by a monster from the other side of this gate uh called a demogorgon and the first season is everybody like the parents the police and the kids all trying to figure out what happened to Will. So it's kind of like this this really horror mystery of everybody's coming to realize what the viewer already knows is that there is monsters involved and they are terrifying and that Eleven, this poor girl who has been basically raised in a laboratory who can barely speak, is their best chance of finding Will and stopping the Demogorgon. So a lot of stuff happens, um, and they they defeat the Demogorgon, and then um, Eleven goes missing. 
after defeating the Demogorgon. It's kind of presumed that she might have died. Um, and then in season two, you find out that Eleven didn't die and that the police chief, um, Jim Hopper, has actually been hiding her out in the woods and acting like her, her basically like a surrogate father to her and trying to teach her, but also keep her safe because there was this big cover up and people died. And so, you know, he's afraid of her basically getting snatched up by the government again. And while all that's going on, we find out that Will, who had been taken to the other side of the, the gate, had been brought back. Was He was not quite normal. There was a lot of weird stuff going on with Will. And so most of the season is spent with Will um, being manipulated by a new monstrosity called the Mind Flayer. Um, which, for everybody who plays D&D, is nothing like an actual Mind Flayer, but it's really cool. Um, so Will is being manipulated across the gate to... Um, because this gate is still open. Like, it never got closed. The, the tear in between planes that L opened was never closed. So there's this creature called the Mind Flayer trying to get through, and because Will was a good vessel manipulating Will into a series of events. Um, and so a lot of season two is trying to get Will back on track, trying to keep him from uh, helping the Mind Flayer to destroy the world, and everybody finding out that Eleven's still alive, and it introduces some new characters, and we find out that Hopper is working with certain sections of the government, um, and a lot of bad stuff happens. It is very brutal. Um, Dustin gets a Demogorgon dog creature <laughs> thing. Um, it gets and, it gets weird, but um, it ends with L closing the tear. And then we also have to we also have to give brief mention to Sean Astin as Bob Newby, who is just the, the 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 sweetest and and, and most tries his absolute hardest to be a good stepdad stepdad, um, but dies horribly in I think the second to last episode. Yeah, it did have Sean Astin playing Samwise Gamgee, basically. It was <laughs> such a cinnamon roll. <laughs> uh, but, you know, like the song says, the good die young. Oh, uh, so, uh, yeah, so, we, and so, one of, so one of the things that, uh, was, that, was, that came about in season two was the introduction of a pair of characters uh, to the cast, uh, and that is uh, Max and her older brother, Billy. Uh, who Billy White, who serves the the role of uh, the bully for season two, um, and Max is a new addition to uh, the group of friends, uh, bringing the total out to a total of six. Uh, and that's important because uh, Billy actually winds up being really important to the plot of season three. So I guess now this is the part where we're going to start uh, talking about season three and uh, the plot therein. So, uh, season three kicks off, uh, I want to say maybe like a year, it, 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 I think it's the summer immediately following, uh, season two, or maybe a year or so afterwards. Um, life has pretty much, uh, gotten back to normal. Uh, Mike and Eleven are, uh, actually dating. Um, if, you know, that's what you want to call sitting in, in the room at Hopper's house and furiously making out while, while Hopper tries desperately to keep the door open to watch them. <laughs> Uh, let's see, um, the, the gang, the rest of the friends have, uh, come back from their various summer vacations. Dustin has come back, uh, from a science camp, uh, with tales of a girlfriend in Canada that, uh, you know, the, the, the stereotypical, you know, I've got a girlfriend that you're not going to meet story that we all had as children. <laughs> uh, and, you know, there's, there's an overall theme of, of, of people growing up and, and how there's this fear that this gang of friends is going to wind up growing apart because poor Will who's had the absolute shit beat out of him over the last two seasons. He just wants nothing more than just sit down and play a game of goddamn Dungeons and Dragons. But everything going on around him, he just, he doesn't get his wish. And it's just, it's, it, I, oh, I felt bad for him. Will, Will needs a break. Yeah, uh, poor Will. Well, it turns out uh, that uh, there is actually, of all things, uh, Russians, uh, a group of Russians who have made uh, a base underground uh, in Hawkins. And uh, because, you know, you just can't leave well enough alone, they're trying to reopen the tear into the Upside Down, as it's called, 
Uh, and the Mind Flayer gets its uh, gets its chance to basically go, okay, round two. So it winds up possessing Billy and uses him as this vessel to build uh, this army. Uh, we later find out specifically to strike at 11 because it has figured out uh, that she was the one who closed the gate on it. And uh, it has basically made it, it, it's basically become hell bent on killing her. Uh, another plot thread that runs throughout this this season uh, is the, you know, this new mall that was built, the Starcourt Mall. Uh, and it, that, that storyline centers specifically on uh, the ice cream shop Scoops Ahoy and uh, its workers. Uh, let me see here now. I got, I got a cast list here. Let me pull it up here. Um, Robin. Robin, yeah. What was the uh, what was the dude's name, though? Uh, Steve. 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 Uh, with Robin, uh, who's a new character uh, this this season, and Steve, who was uh, who's been around since season one. And uh, Steve, is, over the course of season two, he came to be real good friends with Dustin. So when Dustin comes back from science camp, uh, he brings this rate. He's brought this radio tower that he's built because that's just what you did in the eighties as a as a smart kid. You built your own ham radio, uh, and he winds up intercepting a Russian transmission, which he takes to Steve and Robin at Scoops Ahoy. And because, uh, they wind you know. up <laughs> because Why that's not? what you do. <laughs> and uh, they wind up translating it and discovering a ru- this secret Russian base underneath the mall. Because if you're going to build a secret Russian base in the middle of the Cold War, what better place than underneath a mall? Because <laughs> <laughs> it just makes so much sense. And so they wind up discovering uh, this underground base and, and and infiltrating it with the help of Lucas's sister. Uh, so th- that's that plot thread. The other plot thread that, uh, the third plot thread concerns Hopper and, um, uh, and, uh, Joyce, uh, who, this is, this is what I think is the weakest start as far as plot points go. Uh, basically Joyce is worried that her magnets don't work and thinks that there's something hinky going on. And Hopper, poor Hopper, he's just like, look, you know, I just want to grab dinner and have a normal life, but this this bullshit keeps happening <laughs> and they wind up stumbling across the, the Russian subplot and kit and abducting a Russian scientist. And they're chased by Mr. Not a Terminator throughout the whole series. <laughs> He's totally the Terminator. <laughs> uh, Mr. To- Mr. Mr. Bargain Bin Arnold Schwarzenegger. <coughs> and it all finally culminates. Uh, oh, excuse me. There's a fourth plot thread that's actually going through and that involves uh, Mike's is it Mike or is it Will's older brother? No, Will's older brother. Um, God, so many characters. I can't. Uh, I I can't keep track of them. Uh, John, Will's older brother, John, and uh, his friend, yeah, Jonathan Byers. Oh, Jonathan. Yeah, they never yeah. call him John. Okay. All right. John, well, then. Okay. John. That's what I'm talking about. Jonathan. Jonathan, Karen, who are working uh, for a newspaper as interns, and uh, they kind of stumble across uh, a. Uh, stumbled across the 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 the, de- the mind flayers plot uh to possess people uh and it all culminates in this huge throwdown fight uh at the mall against basically the avatar of the mind flayer um who's been using these possessed people and actually reducing them to this goo that it's using to co- to constitute its physical form within our reality um there's teenage drama, lots of lots of angst, lots of uh, lots of shouting, lots of cons- lots of Russian conspiracy, Cold War era stuff, and uh, it's just a good t- a good rollicking time all around. And there's also some really brilliant fucking jokes. <laughs> At one point, Dustin sings the never ending story, completely apropos of nothing, in the middle of a of what could possibly be the end of the world, and it somehow fucking works because this is the '80s and we were just all on all the drugs back then. <laughs> So uh, let's just start breaking this uh, the, down into its component parts. So, uh, Kat, what uh, what 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 did you think of the uh, the story and, and plotting of season three? Well, um, I rather enjoyed all of it—the story and everything. It it seems apropos of the '80s and also <clears throat> relevant to modern times to have Russia be the bad guys. Um, the, there's there's very little more 80s than a Cold War kind of vibe than having the Russians come and just fuck up what little piece you've managed to find. Um, so I, I, I liked that they were able to keep the same, you know, they weren't 
um, looking around for a new a new monster, basically. They used season two's monster. Um, so there wasn't like a, an escalation issue, you know, or anything like that. We're not suddenly... This isn't supernatural, you know? They're not like, okay, we did a monster, and then we did a bigger monster, and now we have to do the devil. You know, nothing like that. So they're staying with, like, the same theme and the same, like, brand of villains, basically. Um, very, very interesting how they can keep coming back to the same thing. The same, okay, here's a gate, and now there's a monster. Like, they're doing the same thing, but keeping it fresh and fun. Yeah. <laughs> Um, because one of, one of my worries going into this was like, okay, how are they going to justify open gate again? Because like at the end of season two, I mean the the whole government uh, off the whole government lab had pretty much been pretty definitively shut down. So it's like, okay, how are they gonna how are they gonna go back to that? Yeah, and and I like that they did go back to that rather than coming up coming up with something new. They're keeping us in a familiar territory with something that's incredibly alien, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I like, ba- ba- I liked how the, um, basically how the, the mind flayer, um, basically plotted out its, its plan. I really liked the fact that it, it, it wasn't because the Demogorgon and the Demodogs in the first two seasons were very much, I mean, you know, yeah, they were monsters, but they were very bestial. Whereas the Mind Flayer, it's it's made very clear throughout the, throughout the season that, yeah, it's an eldritch abomination, but it's a thinking one. It's it's one that that has a plan and it knows what it wants to do and how it's going to pull it off. And I also really like that uh, it, it, <laughs> it it just on a personal, note, I really like that it used Billy as its avatar um, because I absolutely fucking hated his ass in season two, and then yes. season three rolls around, and I was like, oh good, I have an excuse to want to see him dead. <laughs> yes, and then and then in in true Stranger Things fashion, it just sort of is like, hey, remember how you hate this guy? Now you're gonna feel really sorry for him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and another thing that I really, one of the things I really enjoyed about the story, of this uh, the stories of the season, uh, is how the. One of the one of the great things about the show is how all the different plots and character threads weave in and out of each other uh, and build on each other. So one of the 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 plot threads that um you know is running through this season is you know Mike. Of course, you know, like you said, Mike and Eleven have started dating with air quotes. Um, and, and when early in the season, Hopper has you know gotten kind of a little uncomfortable. He doesn't want his little girl you know growing up too fast, so he basically does the overprotective ba- dad bit and scares Mike into kind of backing <laughs> off. Um, but of course, you know because the, he's you know you know a, a preteen kid, you know he doesn't really know how to articulate to uh, Eleven that you know hey your dad scares the hell out of me, <laughs> um, and it winds up causing this sort of misunderstanding, and they wind up breaking up. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, again, it goes back to how, you know, these, these are kids that are actually kids and they act like kids. So, you know, they, the, it, it, yeah, there's this drama that, you know, Mike is kind of, you know, distraught over the fact that he's broken up with his first ever girlfriend. But at the same time, it's like, you know, later on, they're just kind of like, you know, the, 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 the get back together, but it's not in an over the top, overly sentimental you know, oh, you know, I, 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 I love you forever, and I meant to be together. It's just kind of like, you know, look, this is, this is, this is what happened, and this is what I was trying to do, and I'm sorry. Would you like an M and M? You know, the, the, it, it, the, the season three knows it, well, the show as a whole, uh, but season three especially, it knows when to be when to be low key, and it also knows when to be over the top. And I love that it kept the over the, the it kept a lot of the over top the top stuff for you know the the monsters and the Russians. And it let the, the the kids still be kids, and I absolutely enjoyed that. If that makes any sense, I feel like I'm rambling a lot tonight. Oh no, it really did, and yes, we're both rambling. It's fine. <laughs> um, uh, but like I said, and again, you know, the, the, every everyone everything felt like it had a purpose in the season. The one thing that I didn't like about this season had to deal with. Uh, the relationship between Hopper and Joyce, and that's that, like, you know, throughout this whole season, they just will not stop giving each other shit. 
and I'm just like, you know, when when the 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 journalist guy finally has his blow up at them in the car, he's like, oh god, just screw and get it over with. I was finally just like, yes, finally, just you do something, just like quit fucking screaming at each other throughout the whole thing. Because like you know, it 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 was funny for the first few episodes, but and I and I thought that they were going to finally put it to bed uh, in that scene in the mayor's house where Hopper's like, okay, I want you to forget about sales and come work for me at the police department. But then they just started up again. And I'm just like, oh god, I'm just I'm just so sick of seeing these two fight. Like, can, can we just like put our shit aside for one minute here, please? I didn't mind that. The part that drove me nuts was Lucas's little. Um, Erica yeah. gets, uh, gets roped into going into the Russian base. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's the only one small enough to, <clears throat> who could fit in the air ducts because first off, they are shitty kids. Like they are like willing to throw themselves in danger and endanger their friends. But like, I don't think realistically Robin would let Erica do this. <laughs> like, I just don't see that as being realistic. So, like, I just can't wrap my right, my mind around why she was there. But she didn't really serve that much of, a, like, a purpose. She was really obnoxious most of the time. Now, I did watch the whole thing twice because I watched it, like, I binged it. And then I rewatched it with my roommate. And I didn't mind Erica as much the second watch through. <clears throat> but, like, generally, I find her almost... Un- it, it, it's just like nobody likes a sassy child who's their only like their only thing is that they're sassy. Yeah, although it did never, lead. She's she's sassy and arrogant and never learns, and that's the problem. Yeah, although it did lead to an epic, uh, epic uh, verbal beatdown from Lucas about the fact that she's actually a nerd. <laughs> from Dustin. Not Lucas. Yeah, Dustin. Yeah, but it's like I'm not a nerd. Uh, no, here's you are. A nerd. Here's why. And he uses mathematics and My Little Pony to prove his point. I absolutely love that. <laughs> that was pretty good. Um, so uh, the now the, a character that I had um, a problem with was uh, the, the abducted Russian scientist. Um, <gasps> no, Alexei. Yeah, Alexei. That was his name. Or at least the name they gave him. Because um, I, I kind of felt like he was... I don't know. I feel like he didn't really add anything except to, he was just there to be a burden. So, <laughs> he was, like... Mm, like he, he was there for you to fall in love with so that they could just kill him. Yeah, well... So, um, that was the, the one character that uh, that I just really didn't jibe with was Alexi. I loved Alexi. Mm. He okay. was so funny. Um, because he's a little bit right and a little bit wrong. You know, um, but like genuinely, you're like, oh, this is somebody who humanizes the opposition. He's one of these scary Russian scientists. But is he, though? He just seems like a nice guy who wants to watch cartoons and not die. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but I mean, just again, just there, there, there's so many different plot threads that 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 run through the season and it's, it's hard to discuss all of them. Um, but like I said, they, they all just come together so brilliantly. Um, and I liked that uh, we finally got to see, like I mentioned in season two when Max was introduced, she was just kind of there and didn't really serve a greater purpose. And I like that we got to see her actually be a more active participant uh, in the party's antics. And I absolutely loved uh, the bit, uh, in, I think the halfway point, uh, where she basically plays the devil on 11 shoulders like okay you know you look mike is fucking lying you need to drop his ass and come shopping with me <laughs> you know because it was just it was i don't know i i i it was it was great to see 11 get to be like an actual normal kid uh for once and i absolutely love seeing that and it just oh it it it, it warmed the cockles of my co- of my cold black diseased heart <laughs> <laughs> yeah um because max's role last season was to be the outsider and this season, she's in on everything. Nobody has to hide anything from her. She's officially one of the party now. So she gets to actually, like, not be shit all over. Like, the first, like, second season was really rough for her. Because she's trying to make friends after coming from a really 
pretty abusive family, all things considered. And these guys are just treating her like trash, really. And it's because they're kids and they don't really get it. And and it's kind of, you know, it's realistic that they would be like, ah, oh, we can't tell her anything. Ah, oh, but we still want her to be our friend because she's kind of cool. And now that she's in on everything, Max can actually like come out and do stuff and, and be part of the conversation, you know? Um, mm -hmm. and, but she also represents, you know, she's she's in it, but she's less traumatized by it, I think. It, it it's not as defining for her because she has her other she has all of her family issues that are her primary trauma so like poor Will just wants to play D&D &D because he spent two seasons like getting kidnapped by monsters and abused by monsters and his friends have spent two seasons trying to help him and she's like yeah but I've spent most of my life getting abused by this asshole <laughs> Uh, going on to Will, uh, I did like that they actually did something with him this season, as, as opposed to just, because yeah, even though he, the, the poor boy, just like, he just wants to play some Dungeons and Dragons and just put all this shit behind him, like, he actually gets to be useful and contribute, because he he basically serves as as the radar uh, for the Mind Flayer and, uh, and it's, and it's, and it's, uh, it's antics, he just goes like, hey, look, every time it's nearby, I get these goose pimples up my neck, and that's, you know, I'm I'm the monster detector. And it's like, yay, I get to actually do stuff. <laughs> yeah, it was nice for him not to be a damsel in distress, kind of. You know, a, 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 a whatever in distress, a poor child in distress. Somebody who, you know, he, he doesn't need to be rescued this season. It's it's nice to, to see him get to be normal and not be kidnapped and traumatized. He's still traumatized, but now he's more proactive about his own fate. Yeah. Um, and and honestly, since he was the one going, hey, can we just play Dungeons and Dragons? He's honestly a relatable character for me because <laughs> he doesn't give a shit about all of this romance um, and, and teen drama. He just wants to play Dungeons and Dragons. And I feel that. I feel that. <laughs> Uh, but of course, you know we can't discuss uh, strange. We can't discuss this season without discussing uh, the the monster design of the mind flare. And can I say this thing was like, like fucking disgusting and terrifying, and I absolutely loved its design. Yes. Um, again, nothing like an actual mind flare. So it's just sort of what you describe this is like a multi legged, really long legged creature. With like tentacle face, I, I, I would I would I would describe it as what you would get if a if a if a if a Tyrannosaurus and a T Rex had a baby. A Tyrannosaurus and a T Rex. Excuse me, a Tyrannosaurus and a Tarantula. Yeah, yeah, that would be. <laughs> it's really horrifying. <laughs> um, I thought that the the ick factor was a lot higher this season with the introduction of the Mind Flayer into the physical realm, like. In the previous season, we got to kind of see it in its own plane of existence, and it was sort of, like, there, but it wasn't, like, hardened into reality, basically. Yeah, it so, didn't have, like, a defined, a defined like, it had, a, it had a kind of escape, but it was a very kind of, you know, not, not really focused. defined. Yeah. yeah, it was like it was out of focus. And it, and, you know, it had, like, these very, like, it was very soft. Because most of the time that we saw it was, like, in a quick vision or one of Will's drawings or something like that. And so it, it, it just looked not quite real. And then when you put it into the real world, and again, like you said, it's made up of people. <clears throat> That's disgusting. Um, it is really, really icky. It is, there was like exploding rats everywhere congealing into this thing, exploding people everywhere congealing into this thing. It was a high gross, high gross factor this season. Um, and that, that, it made it a little bit harder for me to watch because I didn't like the ick, but it made it that much more terrifying because we got to see it getting bigger and bigger until it's like, like, climbing over the mall like a big fucking spider and chasing them down the road like a fucking tyrannosaurus in Jurassic Park. I mean, and then, like, the ick factor continues with the fact that, like, it can, like, it's tendril, feet thing, tentacles, whatever. Like, it can pierce, it can impale. It's just, oh, God, it was so icky. <laughs> but unlike, like, say, season 
one where we had the Demogorgon and that was the villain, the face of the Mind Flayer was Billy. So that, I think, presented really interesting things because this was the first time we got to hear the actual thoughts of one of the monsters. Um, because in the previous season, it was Will saying he doesn't like the cold or he doesn't like this and interpreting the emotions of the Mind Flayer. Whereas this is Billy basically as a mouthpiece. He's like the Metatron of monstrosity. So it's literally the Mind Flayer talking through this human vessel. And, and I think it's really interesting because it really shows the acting chops of the guy who plays Billy. And, and same thing with Will in season two. There was so much nuance and then into these wild extremes that both of these actors have had to play um, as they've been possessed by the Mind Flayer. But Billy really killed it this season because, like we said, he was a bully last season. He was like, wow, I really hate this guy. And they were really just setting him up for the third season to be the main villain. And he just really knocked it out of the park. He's so sleazy and like, ugh, uh, but good to look at, I guess. But then for him to be possessed by the Mind Flayer, you're like, wow, he's an asshole, but he doesn't deserve this. And then watching him like basically lead people to their deaths and then get away with it, you're like, oh, fuck you, Billy. And then you get that wonderful flashback that um, Eleven sees of him in his mind when he was a kid with his mom. Um, and you're like, oh, god damn, I actually feel bad for him. And they had set him up as like a tragic villain pretty early on because it's clear he doesn't want to be under the sway of the Mind Flayer, but he doesn't really have any say in it. It's beyond his power. Like, there's nobody except Eleven who can contend with the Mind Flayer. So, like, Billy was... Doing... And even that's not an even fight. <laughs> I know! Like, the Mind Flayer is crazy powerful. Like, it took a village, basically, to stop it. Yeah, and, and, and the only reason that they were even able to stop it was... It wasn't because of what they were doing to the, the, the Avatar directly. Was they had to close the, the gate and cut off the connection. So... Yeah. And I again, this is it has to be said. One of the things that's made clear throughout the throughout this season is that this isn't this isn't just some mindless beast. This is a thinking creature, and it makes it pretty clear it's after eleven. It knows that 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 she's been the the thing standing in its way, and it wants her dead. So, and that just ramps up the horror because it's like okay, you know, yeah, the demogorgon and the demodogs, yeah, they're uh, they're 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 monsters and they kill people but i mean they're they're, they're kind of just doing what they do you know monsters gonna monster this is a thing that specifically wants you dead and that's what makes it even more pants shittingly terrifying yeah the the previous two seasons were like these are monsters monsters this season it was like they literally came out and said hey it's personal this time this is all for you 11 <laughs> like oh oh no because if if and when they do the next season like, imagine how much worse that's going to be. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm scared just thinking about it. <laughs> so uh, what, were, what were some standout moments for you this season? What were some, what were some moments that you, that you really enjoyed? Um, gosh, there were so many. Because um, for any complaints that we have about characters we didn't care for or plot lines we didn't care for, doesn't matter. We're still so good. Like, even the characters I like the least still had great moments. Um, I'd say some of my favorite moments were with, um, with Steve and Robin when they get drugged up by the Russians and they're just like laughing over their impending death. And, <laughs> um, and then later when they're coming off of the high and he's basically later confessing that he's in love with her and she has to come to terms with, okay, he's in love with me, but I'm definitely lesbian and and like that coming out story like both of them being so brave really they're being emotionally brave with one another i thought was really really well done um and uh gosh we we have to talk about the final episode uh <laughs> where we finally get to meet Susie. 
Susie is <laughs> is Dustin's uh, girlfriend in Canada. <laughs> girlfriend in Canada. She's his his, uh, his camp girlfriend that who lives in Utah, and they're supposed to talk, and they've tried to get her to come on the radio, and everybody says Susie's fake. And everybody doubts him so much that you're watching it going, Susie is definitely real. And so at the last minute, they need some help. Um, and, and Dustin's like, I know, we'll talk to Susie. And Susie turns out to absolutely be real, but she won't tell Dustin the information that she needs until he sings the theme song. <laughs> to the never-ending story. <laughs> never story. And they have and... this beautiful duet. <laughs> In the middle of of the the climax of the yeah. show. For, for for context, as this is going on, you have uh you have you have Hopper and Joyce in the in the base in the Russian sneaking into the Russian base with soldiers chasing after them. You have the Mind Flayers Avatar chasing after uh the 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 Eleven and the rest of the gang in a car, uh and all this crazy shit going down. And if they're on the they're on this radio that they're, they're, they've been talking to each other through walkie talkies, and everyone is listening to this conversation between Dustin and his girlfriend and hearing this song, and everyone just gets this look on their face, like, "Oh my god, this is really happening! I'm going to die!" And the last thing I'm going to hear is fucking Lamal. <laughs> And, and the best part about it is that both of the actors, Dustin's and Susie actors, can sing so well. Like, they're, they both performed on Broadway in singing roles. Like, they're both so good. So it just kind of comes out of nowhere. Like, is this really happening? No, why are they so good? This is ridiculous. And And I don't know a single person who watched Stranger Things third season without having that fucking song stuck in their head for like at least eight days <laughs> <laughs> it's so crazy i mean like i've seen some pretty wild like hey this is this is the season finale and then that happens you have shattered my expectations for all other season finales because <laughs> they didn't just like take the train off the tracks they like stopped a car full on er, treads and tracks and the, the the dirt and you're just like what the fuck is happening it was such a crazy derailment and it just fit the series so well oh <laughs> gosh that was like hands down everybody that I said that was one of the best moments of the show uh let's see one of my uh favorite moments uh came uh from lucas and it's when they're in the uh, convenience store and they're trying to yes. you know get stuff together to you know uh, to to fight back and he sees this fireworks stand and you know lucas never really got to show uh you know how smart he was uh, in the first couple seasons um he was just kind of kind of more the scrappy fighter but uh he figures out that like you know okay look if we take a- enough of these fireworks and we mix these these together uh we can get like you know basically sticks of dynamite here and it actually pays off because they actually managed to use it to actually hurt uh, the mind flayer's avatar uh, in the last uh, in the last battle. They don't manage to kill it, but they manage to you know at least it, at least make it uh, think twice about what it's doing here, <laughs> getting its shit kicked in by a bunch of kids. <laughs> and then in the middle of that, they have a debate over old coke versus new coke, <laughs> which I thought was like you know you you have to address that. <laughs> <laughs> you can't set your show in the eighties and not address new coke. Oh man. Um, so, I liked the the shopping montage with Eleven, and it was just nice to see them being kids and and being girls and going out and doing the thing you would have done in the eighties, going to the mall, trying on ridiculous looking clothes, getting your picture taken, like it just it it and it was like the first or second episode or something, maybe the second episode, but it really was just like ah normality. 80s normality, but nevertheless normality. Yeah. So, um... Gosh, but of course, you know... Good things. It was, a, it was a lot of good moments, guys. Yeah. Uh, oh, but of course, you know, we, elephant in the room, you know, just as just as we had Bob Newby bite it in season two, you know, we have to have our tragic death this season, and uh, Hopper's the one who drew the short straw this time around, and man, like... I, the thing is, like, his death itself didn't really get to me. But man, when they read his letter oh my at god. the end of the episode, I was just oh god, I got broken in half. Yeah, 
That was really, really tough. Because the opera's thing happened so fast. He didn't get like a dramatic on-screen death like Bob did. He, it was just, he was there and then he was gone. And you piece together, this is what they knew would happen if he stood there. He was going to get lasered. And then, then he was gone. And you're like, did they just fucking kill Hopper? And they, they, they kept the camera there a couple of times for a little bit long because they were psyching us out into thinking that he was going to have a dramatic last minute pop up. Like he was going to, you know, climb, pull himself up over the edge or something and, and he would have been fine. But they, they tricked us and it didn't happen. And, uh, so you're like, oh, fuck, this, this is, this is happening. Hop's gone. Um, but it, what, what got to me before the letter was when everybody's reunited, um, and Joyce is hugging Will and she looks over and Eleven is searching for Hopper. She needs to go hug her dad because somebody else is hugging and he's not there. And they make that eye contact. And Joyce says it with her eye contact and Eleven breaks down. And that's when I started crying and then I didn't stop. <laughs> oh my gosh. Because definitely in the reading of the letter, really, really, really emotional. <laughs> because uh, he's you know it's it's hop's letter for like hey could you please like you're growing up too fast give me give me this time but you know make mistakes and we're gonna fight it's gonna be like this but you know this is all part of growing up and blah blah, blah. and it was so emotional and so so beautiful and i like i don't i don't know anybody who stayed right eyed through that it was really really sad and it's and it's read throughout this montage of the buyers uh basically packing up and getting ready to to, to leave Hawkins. So it in a way it, it it it's kind of you know Will kind of casting dark prophecy. He's afraid of the group splitting up, and that's pretty much what happens at the end of this season. Yeah, so. and I can't blame Joyce for wanting to move because you know three traumas is plenty. Yeah. Just get out of Hawkins. Let everything else be someone else's problem. The next time Hawkins gets haunted by monsters from another plane. Yeah. Let that be someone else's problem. But yeah, it it really felt like the end of an era. Even though we know there's going to be another season and that they all have to get the band back together. It really felt like a, like a really rounded whole, like a whole ending. Um, and then they got us a stinger. And I don't know. Some people missed the stinger because it was just far enough in the credits that they had already turned it off. Did you catch the stinger? Uh, I didn't see it, but I did read about it, so I know what happens. Okay, so the stinger, after everything, is, you know, they go over to, they're panning over to Russia, basically. And um, it's two, like, Russian military-looking guys. I guess they're military-looking guys? I don't think they were scientists. But anyway, two Russian dudes, they're, they're walking along, and they come to, like, a locked door and one of them says to the other no not the american and they go to another door and pull some russian dude out and basically throw him into a cage and then out comes a demogorgon ah, ah, ah. and this raises so many questions but the most important question is who those fucking american who's the american is it hopper is it hopper? it fucking better be hopper <laughs> <sighs> Uh, who knows? It could it could be Bob Newby. <laughs> oh my God! Well, we saw him die on screen, but you know, there's always that like, are we being tricked <laughs> and given hope that is not there? Well, I mean, or... you know, can, can, if you, it would make sense because consider just how '80s this movie is. Now, go back and think to '80s slasher films. How many times have we seen Michael Myers just eat it? How many times have they killed Jason Voorhees and they always came back for the next one? So. <laughs> Yeah, but you know that would what? be an '80s thing for them to do is for them to bring back Bob or Hopper. <laughs> yeah, I, so my thing is, is like there's a lot of theory on how Hopper would have survived basically by going the gate and coming out the other side, where somewhere like where the Russians have been trying to open a gate, um, and maybe that's how they got a Demogorgon, um, unless they somehow like found a living demo dog or something, but. That's, like, one of the prevailing theories. But what's interesting, while I do believe Stranger Things would troll us, and that's not Hopper, somebody asked actor David Harbour in an interview, so what's the future 
of Hopper in Stranger Things. And he said, well, did you see the credits? And I'm like, oh, 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 oh. So I'm allowing myself some hope um, that that somehow, some way, that, that that's Hopper. And that he's alive. And um, that we'll have him back next season. Okay. So, uh... So we're kind of running short on time here. So let's uh, kind of start, let, let, let the wild and base speculations commence. Uh, what are some things you'd like to see in season four of Stranger Things? Well, Hopper, for one. <laughs> um, I'd I'd like to see, um, so first off, whatever happens, it's probably going to be during the day because the kids at the end were talking about getting back together Thanksgiving and then maybe Christmas. Mm-hmm. So they did Christmas one season and this one was 4th of July. So maybe Thanksgiving will be the next one. But I, I think it sounded like maybe everybody was going to get back in Hawkins at Christmas. Maybe we'll see. Um, so I'm hoping it's another holiday. Yeah. Yeah. It's been, it's been a different holiday every season. The second season was Halloween. Yeah. So it's got to be during another holiday first off. Um, so maybe Thanksgiving. That'd be kind of cool. I don't know why, but, it, you know, just to keep the theme. Um, I need a hopper to come back. Maybe, like, midway through the series so that we, we start to forget our hope and then, boom, he comes in. Uh, that would be good. Um, I'd like to see a new monster besides the Mind Flayer. I don't necessarily need Escalation. I don't need a scarier. Or I don't need a bigger monster than the Mind Flayer, but something new, like maybe... Maybe the Mind Flayer is tired of trying himself, so is going to send some really terrifying minions that we haven't seen before to try and take out Eleven and the gang. Um, I'd like to see the fallout with Max's family, with uh, with Billy being gone. I feel like that's going to have a big impact uh, because Max's story in this season was particularly good because she hates Billy because he's an a hole who treats her like shit, but it's also like she does genuinely care um, and doesn't want anything bad to happen to him. So she was very distraught with his final outcome. So I think it would have really interesting, if not just plain old horrible repercussions on her family um, with, with her stepdad being the primary abuser and everything. Um... I'd like to see uh, the next group. I'd like to see like uh, Erica with a nerd group uh, doing Dungeons and Dragons because that torch was passed on to her. So maybe like not the next generation, but you know, like maybe a new group of her friends who are all playing D&D now. That would be kind of nice. Um, I definitely need more Robin. Whatever the hell Robin is doing with life, I'm 100% more. <laughs> Um, and, and more with Steve, like, um, just whatever Steve is doing, I'm, and I, I'm interested. I'd, I'd like to, I'd also, I I also care about Nancy and Jonathan, but less than Steve Harrington, (laughs) because Steve is just the best. Um, I'd like Nancy to get the fuck out of that town, I tell you what. (laughs) Like, I'd like her to go become an ace reporter at some real paper in some real town. I don't want... I'd feel bad if Nancy were continually trapped in this shitty town that she clearly doesn't want to be in anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah. I would like to see uh, Lucas kind of get a little bit more time in the spotlight. Um, he had some moments to shine in the season, but like I said, for the for the for the first couple seasons, he was just kind of the other friend. Um, and you know, I, I, he's had the, he's had the least moments to really shine, uh, in, in this series. And I'd really like to see him take, uh, you know, a little bit, uh, get a little bit more time in the spotlight. Um, and maybe kind of see more of, of him and Max together. Um, because it's, it's kind of, you know, it's, it's kind of just assumed that, you know, the two of them are actually spending time together. We don't get to actually see them. One of, the, one of the things that I really kind of noticed over the season was for all the talk about that that about you know Lucas and Max uh, being together and dating, we never actually got to see them interact all that much this season. And yeah, Lucas uh, was kind of like the wise sage who already knew thing about dating, like the fact he'd only been doing it for like half a year. Yeah. Um, so I'd I'd kind of like to see more of more of Lucas and Max, um, and you know, see them take a little bit more in the stage. 
Um, and I, this is this is probably just wishful thinking on my part, but I would love to just see one moment where Will just like goes fucking ham on a monster. It just like where he's just like you know what I have had this to deal with this shit for three years. I'm just gonna go nuts and just kick the shit out of something, some eldritch abomination. I would just love to see that. You know, like what, he just be- beats a demo, like he just beats a demogorgon to death of the pipe. <laughs> yeah, like what if he like started like learning martial arts or or like goes to like firing ranges or just something for self preservation in future seasons, and nobody knows about it. So like. Just all of a sudden, he's just like gets a gun, blam, 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 and just shoots the next monstrosity that comes up to him, and they're like, "What the fuck?" <laughs> all right, but that is all the time that we have uh, for power this week. So I think it's uh, safe to say that uh, we really enjoyed Stranger Things season three, um, and uh, it's definitely worth checking out. I think, I think, I think we're both in agreement on that. Oh yeah, so good. Yes. So uh, Stranger Things, all three seasons, currently available on Netflix. Uh, pretty short series, all told. You could probably power through all seasons in a day uh, if you really work at it. Um, a weekend if you you know go at a more leisurely pace. But definitely worth checking out. And uh, so with that, that is all the time that we have for Nerd of the Third Power this week. Thank you as always for tuning in. We will see you guys in two weeks. As always, I'm Dr. Gonzo. I'm the cat. We'll see you guys in two weeks. Taka, play us out.